playing in multiple leagues. We'll talk about the strategies behind playing in a large number of contests as far as draft prep and as well as playing throughout the season. Plus, it's outfielders galore tonight. We'll finish off the rest of the potentially undervalued hitters as discovered by ATC. Jeff Erickson of Rotowire joins us on this action-packed show next on Beat the Shift. Welcome to another episode of the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangraphs. I am your host, Ariel Cohen, and with me as always is Ruvain Guy. How are you, Ruvain? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Super Bowl is now in hand, is done, and we actually have on the show someone who went to the Super Bowl. Want to uh, welcome to the show from Rotowire. He's on Sirius XM pretty much daily. Jeff Erickson. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. Ariel, Ruben, uh, always uh, fun to talk to you guys. Uh, and uh, hey, I just want to have a baseball season now that, you know, football's in you know, a Super Bowl. It's, it's the demarcation point. It's over. We're supposed to move on to baseball, but here we are. But, uh, you know, I'm still kind of buzzing off of Sunday's uh, experience, and it was, it was truly amazing. Uh, but I am just ready to talk baseball. Uh, unfortunately, we're talking a lot more labor wars than we're talking baseball, unfortunately. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about the lockout as uh, we continue on this show. Uh, but uh, today we've got some great stuff. We're going to talk about some strategy session with playing in multiple leagues. We're going to talk outfielders, our big outfield deep dive of the potentially undervalued ATC players. Uh, so, yeah, let's get right into it and start with uh, our strategy here. And today's topic is talking about playing in multiple leagues. And I know, Jeff, that, that you play in quite a few of them. How, how many leagues do you play in? And maybe, you know, you could tell us maybe what are your one or two most favorite leagues that you do? Well, I, and all of them are, my, are like God's children there. <laughs> uh, I, I can't choose a favorite. But no, I, I love the NFBC format, but I also love my home league that started Rotowire. It's called Amaki. It's uh, in its what, 25th, 26th, something like that year. Uh, AL only old school four by four, except we include Milwaukee because Milwaukee used to be in the American League. It's $15 in dime increments instead of 260 because that's what we could afford when we were in college when this league started. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how old this league is. Uh, but it, it, that's a great league. Uh, I, I love them all. Um, I, I spend more time, I think I have more mind share on the NFBC type format. Uh, because it's so competitive, it, the, the tools that it uses uh, are, are so top of the line. Like I think it's the best commission platform. I think it's the best, you know, certainly for free agents. The ADP data is fantastic. Uh, they they make the user experience really strong, and I've met so many people through that that it's it's been really fulfilling to play that. So I guess I'd say the NFPC is what I probably think of first. But I, I think of them all, and it, they really are different approaches. I'm on the board for Tout Wars. I love I love Tout Wars. Uh, I love, and I know you are a multiple champ uh, time champ in Tout Wars head to head. Or, and I know you're always uh, super competitive in that league. So I love that as well. Um, I'm in probably 18, 19 leagues. My problem, guys, is I'm a big dumb idiot. I keep adding leagues without subtracting any. Uh, <laughs> Like I'm gonna play in Scarf, uh, the, the new Southern California version of Barf and all you know all the the Earth leagues. Uh, there's a they're starting a new Southern California one, meeting all these great people in the industry, in, that are in the Southern California base and doing a live draft. How can I say no to that? Yeah, no, I I hear you. I find it hard to uh, to say no to a lot of leagues, and I only play in about eight of them, uh, which uh, to me is my capacity for really giving really the proper attention. Uh, but yeah, I'm like you, I, I, I think all of them are my favorite. Uh, I, I don't really prefer one over the other. I do have some leagues that I've been in for, you know, a good 15, uh, 20 years almost. Uh, what about you, Ruvain? How many do you play in and, and what are your favorites? I only have six leagues. I'm sorry. I, I don't have time for all that. Um, but I think my favorite is probably my, the home league that I'm the commissioner of because I get to control everything. I get to hear what's going on, what people's you know um, concerns are about how the leagues are going forward, issues, whether it has to do with COVID, injury spot, IL spots. Um, and it just keeps me 
in on what people are actually thinking when they're planning to join the league, when they're trying to, you know, when they're saying, you know what, I don't have enough time. You know what, I don't have enough, you know, um, manpower to do it or something like that. I just really enjoy that. I, I really be, like being in, have the, being the commissioner and having that power. That's all. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. Um, now, but the question to you, Jeff, is, you know, you, you do play in 20 leagues almost, you said, and you must have slightly different draft preparation depending upon the league format, right? Uh, oh, sure. You have, yeah, if you have a daily league versus weekly league versus roto versus categories, how does the draft preparation differ for you, and what do you do the same and what do you do differently? Well, I mean, I think the base is, you know, the, the real base question is, okay, is it a snake draft? Is it an auction? I mean, I think that's your first, your yeah. starting point, you know, and then you deal with all the permutations thereof, OBP versus average. Are there any other different categories? Keeper versus redraft, you know, what sort of keeper is it? it like XFL, which we do at the first, at first pitch Arizona, usually we do it at first pitch Arizona, is a hybrid. It's a hybrid keeper slash dynasty league. This year, we didn't do it there. We uh, did it in December uh, in part because of some, some COVID concerns. Not everybody could make the trip. But in that one, there is a dollar component, but there's also it's also where you don't do contracts. It's just advances by either three or five, depending on how you acquire the player uh, each in any given year. So and then in, and your, your minor leaguers are part of the number that you keep, too. So there's some, a lot of different things there. Is there a minor league component? How much do I need to know about that? And I do all these different types of leagues, A, because I really enjoy the variance. I love the difference, but also... I'm asked questions about almost every single type of format. So I really need to play it to understand it a little bit more. My problem is the most common type of play is head to head. And I don't play any head to head because I'm old. And I guess I've just never, I, I, I played in some over the years, but I really don't play very much in the most popular type of format, which is really weird. Yeah. It's funny. The only head to head league that I play in is tout wars. Um, but you know, Hey, that's what it is. And I'll tell you though, I do enjoy playing different formats because there are nuances in every one. Mm -hmm. And to me, the game is not just playing your favorite format and that's it. I think the the challenge of the game is to find out, all right, what are the rules for this league and devising the right strategy and knowing who the players are undervalued in each type of format and grabbing them like that to me, the challenge of the game. Yeah, it really is. And and when you prepare, you have to know who's in your league. Because a lot of the leagues that we're in, we, we've been in these leagues for years. And we know yep. how these players play. So if we're planning on going after a certain player or a certain group of players, we'll know, okay, in this league we can go after them because we are able to. But we're not in this league because other teams want to go other other participants want to go after them so that's how you know that's how somehow the uh preparation changes also even even some of the nfp the nfpc league that we're in the same people are in the same nfpc league over and over and over again for the past five six years so we have an idea of who's going to take who so we have an idea of uh, going in we're going to say okay we can target this person and not this person because someone's going to go hard after that person yeah absolutely e even in in auction prep for the same type of format we can come up with two very different plans depending upon what we think the market's going to be. And I think the underlying projections of what players are going to do are the same for every league. But the question of how can you find the undervalued players compared to what the league is going to, the room in, and the league is going to do, that's going to be a different challenge. And it differs every year and it differs for every single room and auction that you're in. It really does. It really does. And, you know, towers, I have a pretty good feel for, uh, you know, what each person's going to do. We've been in that one together. You know, I, I know like, hey, Rick and Glenn, they, they average, I mean, they, they rules of engagement. This is what we do. So, okay, I know. I, and I know the players. Larry Schechter is never going to find a guy that's un overvalued. He's never going to reach for a guy. It's going to, he's going to find a bargain according to his values almost every single time. So, okay, well, let's try to prevent him. You can tell when, when Larry feels like, okay, this is this like, you know, there's guys on your outfield list that are, undervalued players. That's like the Larry Schechter wheelhouse. So, you know, okay, maybe I'll bid an extra dollar on that just so I, I don't let, I'm stubborn. I don't want him to get a deal. You know, because I know, you know, there's certain guys like that. Uh, you know, and others are, other players are wild cards. Um, and, you know, you don't always know who they're going to be on or they're going to be, you're not always going to know their draft strategies. Uh, so it, it's, it's fun. Um, and it's fun to know who are the wild cards because you want to see what they're going to do at any given year. Yeah. So being that you play in 20 leagues, um, 
do you diversify the players that you draft? Meaning, do you say, all right, I got to make sure if I'm taking a guy in five leagues, I'm not going to take him in others because I don't want to have the risk of being overexposed to any one player. Do you have that in mind when you draft at all? Uh, maybe only as a tiebreaker. I'm not going to say, okay. Because every time I've done that, it's been to my chagrin. Like, oh, I was all over Bo Bichette, but I've got so much of him. I don't want him. No! I just cost myself Bo Bichette. Don't do that. Um, you know, if you really like a player, get him. Uh, I think the, the, the key is do the research ahead of time. And you, I know you do this. I know Ruben does this. I know most people in our community spend a lot of time researching the players. They know the players who they like. Uh, you know, the fact that you've liked them the, before shouldn't disqualify you from rostering him again. It should be encouraging you to keep, keep going to him. I, I think diversification for diversica- diversification's sake is a huge mistake. Uh, I, I, I don't think you should like say, oh, I'm going to get him in every single league regardless of cost. But at the same time, if it, if it keeps falling in the right place and you're happy with it and you've done the research, you've done the legwork and you're convinced this is right, I go back to that well. Do you agree with that, Ruvain? I do, but I also think that you shouldn't – when I go into a draft, I never say I have to have one – or I have to, when I go into a bunch right. of draft, I don't have to have a share of at least one person. You have to make sure that you have um, the best value. If it happens to be the same person over and over again – that's fine, but I'm not going to go out of my way to say I need, let's say, I need a share of Jacob DeGrom. So I'm, no matter what, in one of these leagues, I'm going to take that risk, and I need that share just in case he hits. I don't, I'm not playing in enough leagues that, that, that I would do that, but if you're playing in a much more leagues, if you're a, a, a career NFBC or and you're playing in 40 or even 50 leagues, which is not crazy because it's monitorable, especially if you're, you know, there's a lot of these draft and holds. You want to have the diversity because you want to make sure that, okay, you know what? If this team doesn't hit, then this team will hit. But I think it's a matter of how many leagues you're actually playing. Oh, I'd agree. I agree with that. If you're playing like a DFS approach and a tournament approach, then you, then diversification matters a lot more. If you are, you know, if you play in six main events instead of just one or two, well, yeah, then you might want to have, you know, shelter yourself a little bit from disaster. I think that that is a good point. Uh, if you're playing in, you know, you're Eric Heberlig and you're playing 40 plus Rotowire Online Championship leagues, okay, yeah, that makes sense a little bit more. Uh, but I'm just talking it just, and I, I always feel like I'm at the high end of league numbers, and then I talk to some people that are crazier than I am, and it's it, it always shocks me a little bit. But yeah, uh, I just I I don't want to go. I I the big point I really agree with you on though is, you know, I never want to be that I'm going into draft I have to get this guy. You know, I want to be like, I, I want to learn from Phil Dussault and want to have all the optionality possible. I want to be able to take what I can when there's a bargain that's available to me. I want to have that flexibility. I don't want to put, pin myself in a position where I have to take anyone. Yeah, I, I agree with almost everything. The only thing I'd say is that if you are playing in a large number of leagues, um, for the highest value players, maybe you shouldn't overexpose yourself. Because remember, what you're trying to do in the top two, three rounds of draft is hold value. You want to take high floor players, less risk. So to that extent, you don't want to have a situation where you've got Bo Bichette in every single league, and then he's hurt. Oh, no, 16 out of my 20 leagues. There you go. (laughs) Uh, So Draft order usually takes care of that, though, doesn't it? Um, You know, you usually aren't going to get the same slot every time. You know, know, the random number generator takes care of that for us. Well, it could it could happen in an auction though, that where you say uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go forty dollars for this player and you just buy him everywhere. You know, I, I yes, uh, I, I, yes, obviously in in a draft, you know, at the very very top, you're not gonna end up with the same player because of that. But in an auction, it could happen, or it could even happen in the third fourth round, right, where you're drafting in the middle and you know you're just much higher than the audience on everybody. You shouldn't take the exact same guy in every single league at the top. At the bottom, though. I mean, who cares? If you're in the uh, 19th round, so what? If the guy gets hurt, you drop him. You can take him in all your leagues, you know, if you're banking on some upside. If you're if you're banking on what you think is a huge bargain, why not at that low level, you know? 100%. Yeah. So what do you do in season to keep track of all your leagues? Because that, that's, that's a lot to keep track of. And there's A, waiver wire pickups, and there's B, setting lineups. There's information known and – you know, I, I find that when I'm looking for players, and maybe you can tell me if, if you do this too, is that I always look for free agents. I start at the most shallow league first. 
and you know we have a ten team league, fewer players, you know only one d eight, only one utility slot. I find mm-hmm. that when you look at the uh, the most shallow level, uh, sorry, two 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 utility slots, the most shallow level, you get more guys available on the waiver wire rather than if you look at your deepest league, you're gonna see nothing there. So I base a lot of my prep on the most shallow league first, and then I go through from shallow to deepest and see, okay, who can I add this week on the waiver wire? Is that, is that what you do, or how do you keep track of it? I'm not as I, – I don't, like, order it necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's chronological in terms of when I draft it, and I add them to my folder, uh, a bookmark a folder for the, two, the season's worth of leagues, and I just open them all up in tabs usually, and then just go one through one every day. Okay, what happened in this league today? What are, what are my issues on this league? You know, you know, and I certainly, as we get deeper into the season, that might might I might spend less time on a given league, or you know, depending on the day of the week. The leagues that don't have Sunday Fab, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on Sunday with them. <laughs> but uh, you know, s- something like that it, it certainly applies. But I I, I don't have an ordering necessarily there that matters as much as, as much as I do. I just like to go through them every day. Just do a flyby on it. I mean, I'm lucky guys. I don't have a real job. Um, this is my job. Uh, I do the shows. I do my articles, of course. Uh, so it's not just managing my teams, but managing my teams is part of my job description. So that helps. Right. Ruvain, what, what do you do? Monday through Thursday, I enjoy baseball. I just watch it. I get a feel of what's going on, get a feel of trends, because it's like Rummy Cub. It's Until it's your turn to do something, there's nothing really to do except just to watch and see how things are going. And then Thursday night, maybe Friday, I'll start looking at the waiver wire in, in, in general. Um, basically what you do, Ariel, I, I'll look at the shallowest league. I'll go. I'll look at the um, the most recent, most picked up players and see if they're available in any of my leagues and just go through it that way. Yeah, I've never heard us use Rummy Cub on this show, by the way. I, I just had to throw that in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> One of my favorite games of all time. My, my wife plays it all the time with me. Uh, so it's a great game. Anyways, uh, but yeah. Uh, now, a question for you, Jeff, is um, in terms of waiver wire pickups, and you you sort of mentioned it a little bit, but you have some times where one of them, the pickups are 8 o'clock, at, at on Sunday, one of them where it's ten, one midnight, maybe overnight on Sunday morning into the middle. Do you ever have a situation where you get the waiver wire pickups and you see what happened at a certain time, and then you because of that you make changes and you go to the next one? Like, hey, of do, course, do, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why, yeah, why not learn from uh, any input we can get? You know, Tout Wars is the first set of bids usually on a Sunday, uh, and. I'll look, not only will I look at mine, because mine's AL only, uh, but I'll look at, you know, the mixed leagues. I'll look at the head-to-head to see what the fabs were there. And that helps inform, make, oh, did I forget somebody? And especially for an FBC, especially I look at those 15 team, the 15 team mixed auction league, you know, that play, apply, or, and the, you know, and that apply in the mixed draft league. And I look and see, okay, oh, they're on that. Oh, that makes sense. Or wow, I, I really need to ratchet up ratchet up my bid if I really want to get this guy. I mean, there's some danger in over you know overvaluing what you get from from just one set of results, but at the same time, it does kind of clue you in a little bit, especially because one of the great things about Tout's platform and on Roto is you see all the secondary bids. You know, like okay, this this drew seven different bids. Okay, if I'm really serious about Reliever X, well, I better, better, you know, ratchet accordingly there. Or maybe I can, you know, say, okay, I'm not going to get him. Let's let's figure out what my alternatives are too. It's funny. I sort of don't like that because I have to expose my plan to everybody. You know, I, I I'm the guy who uh, let's do two for this guy, one for this guy, a dollar for this guy, and I'll put down twenty names. Sure. I probably only need four names, but I do it anyways. And it sort of exposes my plan, so I I don't love that aspect, but I, I well do you're like moving watching. markets already too, so I understand. <laughs> I mean, it's, me no, I haven't won anything in the NFBC in a while, so there, no one's looking at it, seeing what I bid, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> in the end of the summer, uh, Jeff, when you might be out of contention, I mean, you're playing twenty leagues. I, I I hope you aren't, and I hope you are in contention in every single league. But do you uh, then ignore? 
uh, on fab time uh, a bunch of leagues that you're not in contention for? I mean, obviously, you know, we all want to play the hardest we can, but the reality is, you know, why spend the time? You should prioritize your time on stuff that you can win, and if you're in last place, why not? How do you work that at the end of the year? I don't ignore, but I'll spend less time, without a doubt. Um, I mean, I think it's only natural. Um, you don't obsess about that league. The pr- the trick, though, is don't give up too soon. Sometimes these teams, you know, it, you know the nature of baseball. It's a long sport. And I know we all want to get caught up in the moment. You know, I was talking with John Legazi today, talking about rolling averages. You might want to use that as a tool to help you, you know, make, make sure you're not, you know, giving up on a guy or a team or a set of players too soon. Uh, I've seen a lot of comebacks, especially like the, in the 12 team leagues, you can see it all the time. You see some massive changes, uh, in the standing. So be careful not to give up too soon. Uh, but yes, it, I think it's human nature that we spend more time, more time on the teams that are contending or closer to contending than the ones that are falling off the pace. Yeah. And I did hear, hear that show today. It was a good show with John. Uh, he's such Thank a you. passionate guy. I, I love listening to him. If only he brought some energy to the podcast, it'd be <laughs> nice. No. Yeah, he, and when, when does pre- when does prep start for the following season? Why doesn't why can't it start at the end of the, the season you're in? You can you can learn so much from yeah. the last two months of the season for next year. So it's not if you ignore those teams, you may miss something that you may not have, may have caught if you're just keeping track of them. Agreed. Agreed. And Tim Heaney, when he and I used to do the podcast together, we would do a series of mock drafts in September uh, for the next year. And I think it's probably something I should reinstitute because I feel like I learned a lot that way. And you can like, because if you're not on a particular player within the season, you might not be acutely aware of all that they've accomplished. Uh, and, and especially relative to the position or relative to the category, you might like, oh, oh, really? He has this. How many stolen bases does he have? When I do the projections later on in the season, of course, I, I get, get up to that. But uh, it, it would be, probably be helpful to know in August and September, too. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the lockout. Um, well, don't want to talk about the ins and outs of what's going on because that's somewhat depressing. But uh, let's talk about it, how it affects our fantasy baseball drafting, as as it should. Obviously, if uh, the season's going to start a little bit later, it could affect the way you draft. Well, well, how about you, uh, Jeff? What have you done so far in terms of the lockout and, and how it affects your, your drafting? Are you doing anything differently? Not really in terms of the draft itself. Like, my, my, my players I'm going after haven't had too many changes there. Uh, I... I think maybe like everybody else in these draft and hold leagues, I'm pushing up closers a little bit because just because the, the sheer uncertainty. Uh, I would say that I'm going to try to avoid doing draft and hold leagues after the lockout ends because I think anytime you're doing a slow draft, some people like to maximize the amount of time that they're on the clock to, in case of news breaks. And I think that's going to be an acute problem. And it's just a personal preference. It's going to drive me crazy seeing people do that. Uh, I, I already hate it when people you know do that. I want to... You know, I want the shorter the clock, the better. I just, I like drafting. I don't want to, I don't want to take forever. I understand we're all given a certain window for a certain reason. And I, I, it's happened to me. I'm in the middle of a podcast or something like that. I'm not going to make a pick, but at the same time, when some people purposefully stall, wait for news overnight, that happened to me in TGFBI or where someone ne- in, in years where someone's been next to me and they just, ref- they don't, they'll, they'll make one pick and then they're on the wheel and they'll turn, and they'll wait to make the next pick till the next day. I'm like, don't do that. Don't be that guy. Um, so I'm going to try to make sure I do more live drafts in March or April or whenever we draft, uh, whenever it ends, because there's going to be so much more, so much changing information then that I want to be in slow drafts. And that's my own personal preference. Ruben, what about you? Yeah, I don't think I'm changing that much either. Um, I mean, the values of the players are still going to be the same relative to the, to the how long the season is. It's just basically no one knows the closer roles, and that's why the closers are being bumped up so high. Um, but what I think the lockup is really going to affect is the first couple weeks of Fab because the team, the leagues that are drafting when the lockout is going on, the first couple weeks of Fab, there's going to be a crazy free for all for all these players that signed or were traded. So I don't think it's going to affect the drafting as much as much as the first couple of weeks of the season. Yeah, that's a good point about Fab and 
probably another reason why pushing up the closers makes sense. I know, Ruvain, you and I did point-counterpoint on the uh, last couple of pods about the closers, but, yeah, it, 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 it makes sense that, you know, the less certain you are, the certainty of having some of the top closers, well, whatever we call certainty about them, they're not safe either, uh, makes a lot of sense. I know we've mentioned in the show guys like Ronald Acuna. Um, I, I think that we should be pushing them up a little bit more. Again, if, if some of the season is going to be missed at the top, he certainly is more valuable. And a guy like uh, Ramon Laureano, who is going to be suspended for the first 22 games, I think, uh, he's going to be worth less because now he plays less of a fraction of the season. But overall, I'm not really changing anything majorly. Um, you know, riskier situations are riskier. The only f- exception that we did mention in the show once or twice is mono leagues. Mono leagues are a little bit nutty because there's so many unsigned free agents, and most rules of mono leagues are well, you can you can draft an an unsigned free agent, but of course, if they sign in the wrong league, well, you don't get any stats yeah. for them. Um, do you think there's a big issue this year, Jeff, with mono leagues with the number of signed, or it's just something really fun? You know, honestly, I think that's a great point. I hadn't even given that much thought because most of my mono leagues are going to be later. That I don't have to worry about that as an issue. But, you know, it's it's massive. It, it's massive. And I think mono leagues, you already prioritize playing time, though, uh, uh, more than you would say in a mixed league format where the, the right. replacement pool is better. I mean, you re, you know, Jason Gray always used to be, you know, beat everybody by drafting the non-stars like a team full of 17 to, you know, 15 to $20 players instead of spending, you know, the $30 players on the stars, maybe it, just because they get playing time. Uh, you know, Nick Markakis would be his best player, you know, and he'd be like $21, you know, Orioles version of Nick Markakis here, you know, <laughs> just thing, things of that nature there, where, you know, playing time is king. And that's, that's even more so, especially if you're like forced to say, okay, well, you can draft this player if you want to, but if he signs in the NL, tough luck, you're out of player. You know, I don't, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how leagues handle that. Maybe they have a different rule if the lockout hasn't ended by the time we start doing our draft on these mono leagues. Uh, boy, it's a can of worms. I hadn't even thought a whole lot about that yet. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, it's an issue for, for guys who are draft. I know labor, AL and NL, they're drafting in two weeks' time, yep. and there's quite a few people. Fre- what do you do with Freddie Freeman? I mean, usually you get like a, close, a closer or an unsigned guy, $8, $7. But what do you do with Freddie Freeman? I mean, he's a right. thirty-five dollar player in, in whatever league he's going to be in. You're going to spend fifteen, twenty dollars, and you might get a fat zero. Ah, it's very, very tough. Yeah, and you know the thing is, like usually with, and I've done labor in person uh, that those the AL and the NL uh, that first week in March, usually in Arizona. Now it's in Florida, but uh, and there's one or two, maybe three guys like that, and they they show up on both teams' rosters. We're gonna have. 50 guys like that. Yeah. Unless things change in the next week or so. And I won't dive into those details, but it doesn't look promising. So uh, it, it, it's really going to be t- a tough decision for us to make. That's for sure. I will say, though, that the actuary in me actually likes this because we'll get a really good sample size of what the error bars are between the two and Mm -hmm. we'll 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 have a better way to price players in the future by seeing what happened this year right you know usually it's just three four guys but uh, with that many people of value you'll actually get a nice indication of what the right price discount should be and you know how many you should take on uh, in a team uh uh, all sorts of nice studies with risk so i'm i'm chomping at the bit i'll tell you that (laughs) yeah Talking about outfield now, and uh, for the rest of the show, we're going to be talking about ATC undervalued outfielders. Uh, But before we get into the specific players, uh, let's just set the stage with how the player pool looks. Jeff, in your opinion, how does the strength of the outfield position this year compare to previous seasons? Are you seeing it being a weaker position, top-heavy, bottom-heavy, spread out the same? Like, what, What do you see this year? You know, I always, you know, the, the, the idea is it's always deep and then you get into it and you, you know, around 19 or, you know, around 15, 18, you're seeing all these platoon guys. You're like, where are all the good hitters go? Todd Zola made that comment, especially in the 15 team leagues. You know, I, I think in an era where, you know, I, I think in this era, it's harder to find that playing time. Guys sit out a little bit more. Uh, you know, they don't keep rosters deep enough. So you can't ha- be Earl Weaver and have platoons at every position, but I- I'm finding 
it a little more difficult to find outfielders. I, I, I honestly, I, I think it's just there's more and more pitchers to go in, in these areas. I want to get my outfielders a little earlier than I have in the past. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that the replacement level of the outfielder numerically is definitely deeper than usual. Um, I, I use Z scores to get the replacement level, and I'm getting mm-hmm. this year 383. Uh, negative 383 for a placement level. Just a couple years ago, it was 2.87, 3.06. So it really has taken a dive since. And um, I think it has to do a lot with the platoons. And you don't see shortstop being platooned, really. No. You don't see second baseman being platooned exactly. You see the second baseman actually sharing positions with other. They're, they're moving around. Like There's no more second baseman that come up as second baseman. It's just a failed shortstop who now can play everywhere, plus the outfield. Like Look, look at Gavin Lux. He's out playing the outfield now also. You know, mm, That's right. Well, there's also one other, th- one other thing. 128 outfielders hit the IL last year. 128. That's because injuries are up. I think if players are, you know, taking better care of themselves and hopefully have less injuries, you'll find that the outfield won't look as shallow as it did last year. Ruben, you've probably looked at this better than more than I have. Would you agree with the premise that teams are more inclined to put a guy on the IL now because we have a 10-day IL instead of a 15-day IL? Yes, and that's probably going to come up in some of the negotiations that teams are doing that, and that's not it's not the way the IO was intended to be used. I mean, the IO is supposed to be for injured, literally injured players, not for a player to be quote unquote rested or something like that. It, I, I think it's it's going to be a, a from moving on. I think it's going to be. I think they're going to make they probably will change it back to a fifteen day because ten day it, it doesn't make any sense because. For a starting pitcher, that's two starts. Basically, if you have an older pitcher, you just put him onto the IL. He rests for two starts to say, oh, he has a sore shoulder. Everyone gets worried. Everyone puts him on the bench or starts dropping because he's an older player. And then he comes back two weeks uh, two weeks later saying, oh, I'm, I'm suddenly better. No, I, I think the, the the lockout and with the negotiations, they're actually going to be discussing this. I think that's one of the point of contentions as well. So let's, let's get to the, the outfielders itself. And um, you know, just to set up as we usually do, we don't talk about every single outfielder. We talk about the ones that ATC deems as an under as an undervalued player. Like here's a potential bargain. Now, I don't always see an eye to eye. We don't always see eye to eye on every single player with ATC. Maybe we think something's up with the projection. Maybe we miss something. Maybe we're down on it for whatever reason, or maybe we totally agree. But it's definitely a great place to start by looking at potential bargains rather than looking at stuff that ATC says is completely an overpay. So. Let's start here with uh, Mitch Hanniger. Um, Mitch Hanniger had 39 homers last year. That's an incredible number. 100 RBIs, 110 runs. Didn't exactly hit for a great average. He had 253. Uh, he returned $25 in a 15-team 5x5 format. ATC projecting him to be about a $16 player, going for an auction equivalent of about 13 so a modest $3 bargain. He's currently going in the eighth round. ATC thinks he's about a round and a half bargain or so. Um, Jeff, in, any interest in Mitch Hanniger? Do you think he's pretty stable, secure to do to have a repeat? Do you think he's underpriced, overpriced? What are your thoughts? I agree with ATC. I think he is underpriced. I think it's a fear that he might get hurt again. Uh, I think he gets pushed down because he doesn't run a lot. And I think we're at in the eighth round. We're still looking, and, and rounds earlier, we're still looking for guys that might still run because the, the the guys that we that run after that are flawed in other ways. But I, I think the skills are always there. I think he was on the cusp of, you know, in 2018 he had that massive season where he broke out, had the 26 homers then, uh, and then he followed up last year when a year when the ball was not juiced at all. And it hit 39. Uh, you know, he, he showed the growth. You know, he, he's he's healthy now. Uh, I have nothing. I, I like. I, I think I'm going to probably have multiple teams that have Mitch Hanniger on them. There you go. Ruben? I'm going to basically echo what you just said, Jeff. Um, basically, he if he's healthy and he's able to play a full season, you're going to get somewhere between what he did last year and what he did in 2018. His walk rate 
it was down a little bit, and but so was his K rate. So I'm not too concerned about that. And his Babbitt last year was 281. So there's some improvement, some room for improvement for his batting average. His launch angle since 2018 has gone up by almost four degrees. That's why you're getting the uptick in home runs. And if you're concerned that the Mariners are going to start bringing up all their young studs and everything, he is the oldest position player on the Mariners right now, at 31. He is the oldest, so he's considered the veteran. So he's not going to lose any playing time to these young guns when they start coming up either. I was going to say, he, he had 620 at-bats. I don't really have health concerns going forward for him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were, they, they were f- kind of fluke injuries in many cases here uh, for him. I would say the other thing, too, is when they start calling up J-Rod uh, and other players, this is only going to improve the lineup around him. He's not the guy that's going to be replaced. It's other guys that are, uh, you know, it's the Jake Fraley's of the world that are going to get replaced, not not Hanniger. Yeah, I I think he's super stable. The only thing I have, and it's not against him, I think that the profile is the profile. He's pretty stable. ATC risk metrics are, they're not super uh, light on him, but they're, they're neutral, t- slightly towards lower risk. But, um, you know, He's a profile that is somewhat common, you know, roughly 30, 32 homers, 250 average, no steals really. Uh, You know, there's nothing completely unique about him so that in a draft, it really depends on what you need at the round. And there are replacements for this type of profile later on that you might need something else at the same point. Maybe you need a pitcher fits your profile better than him. So there's just, for me, I, I think... In an auction, I can see myself taking him more because, you know, you can take two eighth rounders, four eighth rounders. You can take any any place of a player that you want as long as it adds up to the dollars. And so a bargain is a bargain, and you can translate it. It's only a $3 bargain for me, and the profile can be replaced. So I don't see me, myself taking him in a, in a draft. But those who do, I think he's super stable. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right, next player is, well, actually, before the next player, we have the Injury Gurus Trivia of the Week. The next player we're going to discuss is Alex Verdugo. Verdugo. He is projected, according to ATC for this year, for a 287 average, 15 homers, 6 stolen bases, 66 RBIs, and 86 runs. I saw that line, and then I saw a line that was very close to him. Very similar. I mean, there's a little difference in the RBIs, but very close. I'm going to give you the line, and you name me the player. Okay? This is the line according to ATZ projections. 293 average, 18 homers, which is only three more than Alex Verdugo, eight stolen bases, which is only two more stolen bases, 90 runs, which is only four more runs, 80 RBIs. That's the only difference of the 14 difference of RBIs. Who's that player with that similar stat line? You said 293 average? 293 average compared to Verdugo's projected 287. Well, it's going to be someone that is going ahead of Verdugo. I think that it's got to be the point of the trivia question here. Correct. Uh, Correct. Why draft this guy when you can get Verdugo at that? Um, That's exactly right. uh, Okay, so... Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, I'm thinking on this one here for a second. Bear with me. Uh, I'm Again, going to... 293 average, 18 homers, 80 RBIs, 8 stolen bases, and 90 runs. I'm trying to... Is it Brian Reynolds? No, not Brian I would have said like Jose Altuve, but he doesn't have that big nope. of an average. It's got to be an nope. outfielder. Is it an outfielder, though? Yeah. It's not an outfielder. It's oh, not an outfielder. I was, okay, I was... Yeah, check if if that helps, it's not an outfielder. It does help, though. Yeah, 292 okay. should do it, right? It's such a high average. Okay, so... But All right, with moving. A similar profile. Okay, no, I'm not. So no, ends? I'm not giving no, up No, no, no. All right, don't give up. Don't give No. Oh, don't give up. Okay. I'm not going to give up the fight just yet. Okay. Uh... I'm would say... it be easier if I give you? Would it be easier if I give you their NFPC ADP right now? Uh, that might give it away, actually. But well, Verdugo is at one fifty eight, and this mm-hmm. player is at fifty four. Wow. Okay, that Ariel, is... don't look it up while he's well. No, I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think in my mind who I projected for okay. two ninety two. It's it's very high. Yes, yeah. it is. Um. All right, I give up. Go ahead. 
Wander Franco. Ah, okay. Wander Franco. Yeah, I should have known that one. So you have that stat line compared to Verdugo. Why would you not? If you're looking for those stats and you just ignore the name, just take Verdugo. He's an outfielder, so outfielder is quote unquote more shallow than the shortstop position. Why waste a pick at 54? No, it's not a waste, but why take Wander Franco at 54 when you can get a similar stat line at 158 in the outfield? There, there's other arguments against Wander Franco too, uh, and that, yeah. you, you know, compared to other shortstops for that matter, like. I think you could take and pretty make a pretty good case for Jorge Polanco over under Franco. I think Rob Silver has made that case, um, so I, I won't I won't belabor the point. But I get what you're saying there for sure. I mean, with Ronda Franco, I think we saw what happened with Vlad last year, and people want to be, you know, where the puck is moving, not where the puck has been. But in term, you know, I don't know if he'll ever have like that huge speed upside. So he's got to, he's either got to crush the batting average and crush runs scored. Or something of that nature to just justify that he's a fun real life player, but I I think that's conflated with maybe perhaps his potential fantasy upside. But to have a hundred picks in between those two guys, that's that's just you know name recognition and not thinking about not actually looking at the stats, looking at the names and not looking at the stats. Yep. Well, I think the Franco pick is way overpriced. But in terms of Verdugo, so what I like about Verdugo, and I liked him even more last year at this time. Uh, I thought we thought he was a little bit more of a stolen base guy, maybe a little bit more power. Uh, he's now, we're talking, uh, you know, 15 homers, maybe a half dozen steals, but the batting average is there. There aren't that many players, by the way, who project for a positive Z score, so half uh, the top half of the player pool, the draftable player pool, in batting average, runs, and stolen bases. Um, t- to tell you, uh, here's another mini trivia. Can you name all the players going after player 60 who are in the top half of the player pool in all three of those categories, runs, batting average, stolen bases? You got Verdugo actually does not make it, but he's really close. And stolen bases, he's just a li- like a half a stolen base under. After sixty, okay. After sixty, uh, runs, runs, stolen bases, batting average. Because runs and batting average are kind of correlated, but the stolen bases stolen is the outlier here. Batting Because uh, you don't necessarily have to have that to, to get the other two. Ah, uh, there's there's not too many of these guys. No. Nope. Well, I think uh, you mentioned Jose Altuve. Is Jose Altuve one of them? Altuve is he would he would qualify, he but run. he's go. Well, um. Well, he's he, still, he runs a little. Yeah, he, he's still above above player pool average, but he's going before player 60, so he misses it for that. So he misses okay. twice. Um, hmm. Don't know. Brian Reynolds? I'll go back to Brian. No, I don't think he runs <laughs> enough either. No. Jonathan India? India is one. Good. Wow. You mentioned Jorge Polanco. He, yeah. He counts. I didn't know if batting what average about, would get what there a, with him. Yep. What about Trent it. Grisham? Nope. Batting no. average is holding him back. Batting average yeah. problem. Okay, yeah. Any other guesses before I tell the story? Uh, I mean, what do you what do you do with Christian Yelich's batting average? Yelich, Yelich yeah. is it? I was thinking about that, but his batting average is so questionable last couple of years. You know, that's I didn't I didn't think of him either. Well, but he's still on the list there, uh, so he's interesting. Other than will he be himself? Uh, you got Tommy Edmond, Miles Straw. ATC is very high on his batting average. Miles Straw qualifies. Colton Wong, interesting. Lord knows we haven't had a good debate about Miles Straw in at least seven minutes on Twitter. Right, so <laughs> right. <you go>. right. <laughs> uh, Cabrian Hayes, that was the interesting one. He steals. I have found him to be one of my, like an answer for me when I'm light on speed and on third base. I mean, it, it checks yeah. a couple of those boxes. Like, okay, yep. it, there's some projection there, but that could be like a huge pick. That saves you a lot of a lot of pain elsewhere. Yes, it's a it, this profile of batting average runs and stolen bases is much more unique than the one that has RBIs and homers. That's why it's good to get, especially in a draft. And by right. the way, the four guys who literally just missed it because of runs just missed it by a couple runs: Ahmed Rosario, Gleyber Torres, Avi Sal Garcia, and Gene Segura. They're really super close. So those guys Segura, are actually nobody advocates for Segura either. Uh, yeah, I, I think he is. Ever. He's another guy that I find was going to find my way in a handful of rosters because I I will wait on second base. That yep. is a position I don't mind waiting on, and, I, and he's always there, always there. 
And back to Verdugo, um, I, I kind of think he was a little bit unlucky last year. His homer to fly ball rate was a little bit unlucky. His barrel rate was the highest of his career last year. So I kind of think the power can bounce back a little bit. He is a 4 or $5 bargain. I think he's a great profile to get in round 11. So, you know, you might be doing some other things, but he is definitely an option for me. And I'm much more interested in, in, in an auction for him. And and his career his his career K rate is fifteen point eight. You don't get that anymore. Yeah. That, that that's that's very good. He, that means he makes contact. He's putting the ball in play. That's why he has that high average. Yeah, super super low risk. He's got a one point nine ATC inter projectional standard deviation. Uh, next player, and we have a question from Michael who asks, and the player is Joey Gallo. He says, my my friend Mark thinks Joey Gallo is due for a bounce back because we're moving from average to OBP. My issue is we have offensive strikeouts as a category. While Gallo's value would go up, the strikeouts nearly make him unrosterable. Would Gallo be more than a $10 player? So I guess maybe, Jeff, you can ask, is Joey Gallo roster- unrosterable in a strikeout-type league? And what are your thoughts about him in a regular league anyways? I mean, you can fit any player to you – know, you can fit him to a particular type of strategy where you're under – you know, you're under emphasizing batting average, uh, but you just have to know that 180 is a possibility. But if he hits 240, you could probably win with that. I think everybody's just running the heck away from Gallo because he face planted in New York, but I think that makes it for maybe a buying opportunity a little bit there. If you, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, I, I say that, but I haven't rostered him once yet. So there's always seems like in the leagues I'm in, there's always at least one patron. Move it. If you roster Verdugo, then you can roster Gallo. Otherwise, his, his average just he's, he's a catcher average. What's the difference between him and a catcher who hits 25 or 30 home runs? Maybe you get those extra 10 home runs, but you're getting more of those at bats and more of those strikeouts. I, I just, he, he, you, you know what you're going to get with Joey Gallo because he's done it every year and he's not changed. He hasn't become, he's not going to suddenly become a contact hitter this, this year and start to spray the ball over the place, especially when he's at Yankee Stadium. He's going to be targeting that right field porch constantly. And he is in a free agent season, so he's going to try to hit as many of those home runs as he could. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with with Jeff on this one that you know he could be a bargain here. He only fits certain rosters and roster construction. Certainly, if you have power, you can't roster him. If you've got a bad batting average, you can't roster him. But at the price he's going for his total value that you would calculate, he's a nice bargain. He's going in the fourteenth round. He's worth a couple rounds. Earlier, because yep. he's almost a 40 home run player. And about the batting average, here's an interesting thing. People say he's a batting average risk. I actually do not think he's a batting average risk because the projections don't have him for 240. The projections have him for 209. It's not a batting average risk to say he might hit 209 when the projections are 209. In fact, the risk is only up. He can go up from that. So if you're baking in on your team stats that have him as a 210 player and you get a 230, that is awesome, actually. Uh, so he, he's very low risk. It's just he doesn't fit every single roster because of categories. Right. I will say this, too. I mean, if you don't have an overall component, that opens the door a lot more. I mean, you could play a punting batting average strategy. Uh, yes. You, could get a, you can get away with that. Uh, but, you know, the, the risk, there, it can always get worse. I just want to remind you, it can always get worse. 181 was a result that happened with yes, him. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, Rugnet Odor is just peeking around the corner saying, hey, remember me, guys? Uh, 600 plate appearances of you know, of that. Of that. I mean, it can happen to anyone. But, yes. uh, and, and you know, Rugi could be very well do that for the Orioles this year. But, uh, yeah, it just, all it does is it, it forces you to just think about your build. I mean, if you've got a bunch of high average guys, though, you, you just can't touch them. Yes, agree. Adam Duval is the next player. Adam Duval is the number one bargain according to ATC versus the current market. That's right, number one overall bargain. He's an eleven dollar player according to ATC, going for about a three and a half dollar auction equivalent in the seventeenth round. But this is a guy who hit thirty eight homers last year, a pace of forty three homers the year before. The batting average stinks, but it's not Gallo stink, it's two thirty stink. Uh, RBIs are through the roof. Um, I mean, this is a very, very low risk player. It's not a Miguel. It's it's not Miguel Sano here. It's you're getting a much better batting average than Miguel Sano, and you're getting all those counting stats. 
I I kind of think that he's he's much more interesting than Gallo, and his price is lower than Gallo's, and his value is higher than Gallo's. So uh, I kind of like him. But how about you, Jeff? The funny thing is, people don't realize Adam Duvall is a good defensive player too. So I, that usually kind of contributes to playing time a little bit as well. Yeah, I, I'm on board. Uh, you know, people don't realize that Adam Duvall led Major League Baseball in RBI last year. It's just because he did it for two different teams. He was you know, RBI is obviously a team dependent stat in addition to how well you you play yourself. But you know, I I, I, I don't see any reason why he isn't going to be able to contribute that again. Uh, you know, you know, Atlanta is going to bring him back. Uh, he's going to be on the Braves, so I, I don't see why he wouldn't do that again. Um, I, I think he's going to be in the middle of a pretty decent lineup, especially if they bring back Freddie Freeman. I think that might contri- that, that has a lot to do with his RBI count, but still, I, I think this is a, it's cheap power and not kill you batting average. Yeah. Do we have three for three, Ruben? Yes, 100%, because he reminds me a lot of another player that always was undervalued also, and that's Adam Dunn. Adam Dunn's career batting average was two thirty seven, and he hit somewhere between 35 and 40 home runs almost every year. That's basically Adam Duvall, and you know what you're going to get with him. You're not going to get the Joey Gallo batting average. You're going to get in the 230s, which is not horrible this you know the last couple of years. 230 is not that bad it doesn't kill you too much and you know what you're getting so it's like picking up adam dunn back in the day next player is marcelo zuna another brave now i just want to preface it that uh you know this is a fantasy baseball podcast and um whether we like this guy in real life or not um he still has a value in the fantasy world and you know we're 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 picking up players here. We're picking up their stats. We're not picking up any of these people's morals. Um, if we're talking about Trevor Bauer, which is a touchy subject, if if the NFBC allows us to draft Trevor Bauer on a fantasy podcast, we can talk about Trevor Bauer, whether we like the guy or not. Uh, just throwing that out there. I don't, know, I don't know how you feel about that, Jeff. My approach is if someone if someone is crossed off your list because you object to him, I'm that's that's fine. Uh, if you think he's just a stat that you're, you're buying a stat line and that's it. And that that's fine too. I, my thing is don't tell everybody what to think on this. Don't, don't uh, judge a fantasy analyst for analyzing him. I mean, it, I understand in the moment he is charged in the moment this happens, talking about his fancy value is sounds crass. And I get that, but over time, you know, this is what we do. We have to make a decision on that. My, if your decision is to cross them off your list, fine. That's fine. And you can find comparable players. Uh, I I haven't found myself rostering him yet. Uh, I think that you, you start to applying that rule, you might find yourself crossing off a lot of guys. Um, and so be it if that, that, that's, that, if that's the case. But it is kind of dicey. I just, I, I think we get into too many wars huh, on Twitter about like, who we should talk about and who should we not talk about. And that if someone says they don't want to talk about them, okay, they don't want to talk about them. That's fine too. You know, but uh, as far as Osuna goes, he is going to play this year. So he's part of our player pool. I, I think there's a risk to the downside that he gets less playing time because of everything that's happened. Uh, and the risk to the downside that 2000 was 99 and 2000 were career years. And he was already kind of, an undervalued, a player that was underachieving anyhow. So I probably won't have him in a lot of places this year. All right, Ruvain? Yeah, I'm a little nervous about drafting him also just for the fact that he hasn't really played in quote-unquote organized ball for so long. When you're away from the game for that long, do you want to take that risk that he's going to come back to the level of 2019, 2020, or is he going to come back to the same level? Because in 2021, when he was playing, he wasn't playing well at all, but he is being drafted. He's being drafted in all the leagues, just like Trevor Bauer. You may hate him. You may love him. You may have no opinion on him whatsoever, but he has been drafted on every single league. So he, these people are draftable if you want that. And if you don't want to have to deal with the wrath of the rest of your league um, drafting him, um, you know what? I probably won't have that many shares of him also. I, I, I'm just nervous about him being away for so long. Um, and what he did in the beginning of 2021 really scares me also. So, um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how much that had to do with what was going on in his personal life. But, um, you know, certainly 2020, I'm going to write off as a, just an outlier positive year. I mean, it was a $43 rotisserie value player. That's crazy. 
But the rest of his career, I don't see a year that he's gotten below a $13 value in a long, long time. Uh, ATC is projecting to be a $10 value, and that's with only 450 at-bats. He, I, I kind of think that's more towards a low number. I think he can easily beat 450. Um, the NL is going to have a DH. Now, one of the reasons why he's not a great defender, maybe you shouldn't play in the outfield, I think he might be the starting DH for, for the Braves. And if that's the case, I think 450 is a low number. And if projection projections at 450 have him as a $5 bargain, he think he can beat that as well. So I think in the 14th round, where he used to have to pay fourth round value, I think that he is a bargain. Um, and... He doesn't get you the stolen bases, but his batting average is typically very decent. The counting stats should be there in the middle of a good lineup. I kind of think he's a value. Yeah, I can see it. Charlie Blackman, next guy, who is also fantastic, $7 value. Um, I have heard Rob Silver really gloat about uh, Charlie Blackman, and he thinks that Blackman is going to have a nice rebound. I actually don't think he's going to have a rebound, but at – what the value that I'm projecting, which is 15 homers, just like two or three steals, a good average, 278 average, and 70s runs in RBIs, he's a $7 bargain going in the 16th round, but should be a couple of rounds earlier, and you're getting a nice batting average profile with some good counting stats. As long as he stays on the Rockies, I think he'll still produce that. He'll bat in the middle of the lineup. I think Blackman's another nice little value you can get in the mid-late rounds. Jeff, you agree? Yes, yeah, sure. Old and boring. You know, that, that's Old fine. Boring. Again, you, you at this point, you're not looking for stolen bases with him. You're just right. trying to get the counting stats. You're just trying to count on 140 games. That's what you're hoping for from him. Ruben? Yeah, he's he's a safe stock to have in your portfolio because you know what you're going to get. He's, he's not a major risk. I mean, he is getting older. He's 36. But you know what? His K rate went down. His walk rate went up, which means his eyes getting better as he gets older. You know, sometimes just like wine – People get older and, and they they age well and they, and they and they see and they're able to and he's still in Colorado he's still in Colorado and until he leaves Colorado you, you got to take him because he's going to bat in the middle of that lineup because that lineup right now is very um, below average I'm going to say right now and Charlie Blackman he's still considered in that lineup above average so he's going to play. Austin Hayes is the next player who is the lowest projected intra SD of any player. An intra SD to remind everybody is how balanced your category is. I have him projected for 21 homers, six stolen bases, 257 average, 73 runs, 68 RBIs. Those are all very similarly dispersed. So if you're building a roster, he gives you just a hint of every single thing. If he gets injured or underperforms, he's not going to kill your category balance. He's the stablest guy in that regard of the entire player pool. The next, uh, hot, the next lowest, just to throw it out there, is, uh, by the way, Luis Urias, who is very, very similar to that regard. He's a $6 bargain, going the 16th round. And by the way, his other ATC uh, risk metrics are all really low. 1.8 interest, D, a negative 1.1 skew. Uh, this is a guy who, he hit 22 homers last year, um, and 12 of them came in the last two months. So if he suddenly figured it out in the end and, you know, chalk up the first half to injury or whatever it could have been, you might get a 25, I'm not going to say 30, but over 25 homer player with at least a half dozen steals, an average that won't kill you. I think it's a nice bargain in the 16th round. Jeff? Let me preface it by saying I preface this by saying I do like Austin Hayes for the reasons you cite. I will say he slugged 528 at home last year, 400 on the road. They're moving the fences back and up to, in left field in Baltimore. I don't like that for a right-handed hitter. So that's one thing I'm a little concerned about with uh, Austin Hayes. Sure. The the price, but that's that's kind of baked into his draft cost though too. Um, so yeah, uh, he's a sol- He's he's a he's he's just fine to have as your your fantasy fifth outfielder. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing, though, about the Baltimore fence is, obviously, he's going to hit less homers because of that. So, yeah, maybe the 25 number goes down to 23 or whatever the upside is for him. But the, the price is going to be baked. I mean, true drafters know, oh, well, i got to cut this guy by a little bit. They're going to cut their draft price. The market price goes down. And I kind of think it's in parallel. So if he was a bargain before, he's still going to be a bargain. And the same is true, by the way, for Mountcastle. Mountcastle, sure, he gets hurt quite a bit. 
but he's, you're also going to get a nice haircut on his cost as well. Yeah, at least in the leagues, they're paying attention there. That's for sure. Hayes also hit 26 doubles last year. So even though even when the balls aren't going off the wall, over the wall, they're going off the wall. If they bring the fences back and move them back, so his batting average may go up a little bit because he may get more. I think Todd Zola mentioned this, that because they're bringing the fences out a little bit, people's batting averages may go up, but their power stats may go down. But the doubles, that may still stay the same. The one thing I'm concerned about Austin Hayes is that he's got a 5% walk rate, and that's a little bit concerning. Yeah, that is a little bit low. Um, all right, next three players we're going to do together. They're all going in the 18th, 19th, 20th rounds, all for a nice couple dollar bargain, according to ATC. One is Max Kepler. The next is Mike Yastrzemski. And the third is Raymond Tapia of Colorado, all for different reasons of, of value. Um, what are your thoughts on those three? Do you like any? Uh, do you not like any? Uh, Kepler, Yastrzemski, and Tapia. I'll start with you, Jeff. I, I'm uh, an. Uh, yeah, as apologist, I, I've had him a lot the last two years. I know last year did not deliver. I feel like there's some bounce back in that. I like him the best of the three. Tapia, if you're going to try to find some average in runs, it's probably, I mean, average in stolen bases, it's probably a better option. Yeah, as you're going to get a little bit more power. Uh, of, of course, lefties are a big issue against Yaz. That's the one th- the one big thing that's a, it's a huge problem. And the fact that San Francisco platoons like cr- crazy. They're... they're He's not going to play much against left-handed pitchers this year. I think we know that. Yep. Moving. I think that Yaz and Kepler are mirror images of themselves. Yep. They are. They both will hit two thirty around two thirty in the two thirties, mid twenty home runs. So you can call them even an, those both an Adam Duvall light. They're going to get the same type of batting average, just a little, just less home runs. I like Romeo Tapia the best of all of them because he's he bats lead off. He's a late stolen base guy with a little bit of pop. He hits the ball on the ground 67% of the time, so he's utilizing his legs. He goes up the middle 40% of the time, so he's trying to beat those, you know, beat out those hits. Um, the only thing I'm concerned, also, again, a low walk rate for, for a leadoff guy, but now nowadays, the leadoff guys like Rizzo and Schwarber, you don't really care so much about the walk rate for a leadoff man, but he, Tapia gets on base. He's in Colorado, a leadoff hitter, and those are things you look for. Yeah, I'll tell you that last year I had Tappy on a lot of teams. When he went down, that was a big part of the team because I depended on him for a nice batting average and for stolen bases. He had 20 stolen bases last year with a 273 average, and I expect him to do something similar. So he's very vital in that regard. problem with him is that he gets you like no homers, almost no RBIs. So you really do have to be fine in those two categories, and, and those are cheaper to acquire. So... You know, it's e- it's easy to build around him. And, you know, again, if, if he fits your roster later, great. I am a little concerned with his playing time. I don't know that he's going to last as the leadoff batter all year long. Um, Colorado does crazy things. Uh, but, yeah, he, he should be fairly safe. Uh, he only had 40, 487 at-bats last year. It's, you know, from a leadoff batter, you would really expect a lot more. So I know he got injured, but y- y- you would you know, he's a little bit concerned with that. Um, Yastrzemski has a better value in a daily league because of the platoons. So if you are in a daily league, I really love Yastrzemski. In a weekly league, you got to deal with San Francisco platoons. So uh, he's a little bit tougher to deal with. Kepler is, uh, to me, just a solid guy for the profile. And he steals some. Kepler had 10 steals last year, the pace of 8 the year before. So, you know, you're not taking a zero in that category. So I actually like his dis- his uh, dispersion of of uh, categories a lot better. He's a lot more balanced. So to me, Kepler is the best of the lot of these three, if I had to make a choice. All right. Uh, we have time for one or so uh, mailbag questions. Uh, Don asks, Christian Pache is a defense speed center fielder likely to see an increased opportunity in 2022 thanks to an aging, injured out- Atlanta outfield that should eat up DH at bats. Do you have any other fringe NL outfield with maybe some glove speed that you can see some similar increases? Thank you. Jeff, any thoughts on an NL outfielder who has some glove speed who can continue? Um, you know, maybe, you know, I, I kind of like Jesus Sanchez. I don't know if he com- completely fits that profile that you're going for here. Uh, but I'm trying to think of, you know, I, I, he, he's probably more mainstream than we're looking for, for than Pache. Uh, but I, I, I do like that. I think that the Marlins are a place to look, uh, just cause things are going to, I think their guys are going to emerge a little bit more. Uh, 
I don't know. You know, I might look at uh, actually Pache's teammate, uh, Waters, Drew Waters, as a guy that might also be a, a pretty decent value. All right, moving. Any, any names to mention? Fringe guy. I don't know if I want to call Harrison Bader a fringe guy, but he can get you some stolen bases. He's pretty solid with playing time. And also in Milwaukee, Lorenzo Kane. Isn't he considered a fringe guy right now? I would think he's a fringe guy, and he still will get you some of those stolen bases if he stays healthy and if he plays. Interesting. I'll throw out, uh, he's not he's not young, but Rafael Ortega, he got a lot of nice increased playing time with the Cubs. Uh, and Lane Thomas, I don't know if he's fringy, but he, he could be interesting. Clay and uh, Todd were doing their pod on Friday and talking about Lane Thomas. And, you know, clearly playing time is going to come there. You, you might not get the same return on playing time that he got last year. As he plays more, you might, you know, probably on a per at bat basis, he won't do as well. But I, I think he's a very sneaky guy to add late in drafts. You know, get maybe, a, you know, 18, 8, you know, 2010 sort of year out of him. I could see that happening. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you agree on that one. Um, yeah, he's a nice little fringy guy that you never know could, could sneak in and do something. Uh, Jason King asks, uh, I, I guess he, he's asking for some more sleepers or so. 12-team auction keeper league. He's keeping three of his, his six outfield spots, telling us that he has Mookie Betts, Jordan Alvarez, and by the way, it is now Luis Robert. It's not Luis Robert. He has now told everybody he wants to be called Luis Robert for, for everybody's clarification here. Um, who are a couple of cheaper upside outfielders to save some salary on? Any other outfielder names to throw in late that are interesting to you in a 12-team league? You know, it, 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 I'd rather have you – know, funny thing, it's kind of open-ended. I'd rather find yeah. – you know, ha- have a list of names and say, I like that guy. Yeah. You know, um, batting average is a risk, but if you're looking for super cheap power, Seth Brown might not be bad. I think he's going to get a lot of playing time. Uh, he'd be like a bench guy and a 12-teamer, though. Uh, it's not someone you'd be starting at least to begin the season. Right. Ruve? Someone like Brandon Nimmo. He's going to get a lot of playing time. He's toward the end. You may get him real cheap. And then also I have – second, I have uh, Garrett Cooper. Garrett Cooper is going to get some playing time also. If he stays healthy, when he's healthy and when he's on the field, he qualifies at first. He qualifies in the outfield, I think. He's someone who can give you some great, you know, upside. Just have it on your roster and hope he stays healthy. That's all. Yeah, and the, the DH might help him. So uh, that's a good pick there. Uh, you mentioned Harrison Bader comes to mind in a 12-team league, probably as fringy at the bottom. Uh, Tommy Pham, I mean, he's got the power-speed blend. Maybe he's cheap. Will Myers, I think the DH helps him too. Um, so I'd say him. And Mark Canna, um, he's always interesting for his interesting profile. He gets on base. Uh, and I think the Mets lineup has improved here, uh, so I'd throw out those as well. Cool. Any other thoughts about outfielders? Anyone? No, just uh, you know, know that if you're waiting on, on outfielders, know your targets, know your later right. round targets. Uh, I think that's true with any quantity. You know, if there if there's something you're waiting on, then at least you know be prepared to jump on those guys and o- over ADP even. Anything that you're waiting on and you have guys that, oh, I really like in this range, chances are someone else out there has also done the research and likes that player too. There's very few secrets out there. We're all, we're all blabbing this time of year talking about the guys we like, and they're furiously scribbling down those names and looking into themselves, and they're probably like, oh, yeah, I see that. Okay, I'm going to move them up. And then come March, oh, I thought I could get them here. No, you could have got them in November. You could have got them in January. Can't get them now. Yep. No, good advice. Anything else, Ruvain? Yeah, I think you can get a lot of value to the middle to late of the outfield pool. I think a lot of people are going to spend more money middle infield early, or top of the outfield very early, and then the middle to the end of the pool, you're going to find a lot of bargains. You're not going to get maybe a $2 bargain, $3 bargain, $4 bargain, but you know what? All these bargains add up in the end. I'm not saying you should pack your whole outfield with 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 $20 to $15 to $20 outfielders, but you're going to get a lot of bargains toward that area, the hot spot. Yeah. My, my advice is just early on, uh, get players with profiles that are easy to build rosters off of. You know, you want somebody that has some steel. Don't get the big power guys early. Um, I mean, it's hard to pass up on like a Jordan Alvarez, but 
in terms of in a draft profile building, you can get some of his power available later. He's got a good average too, but uh, you know, we're talking about the the big power guys. I mean, like George Springer, same type of thing where a lot of power you can replace that. But somebody who does a little bit of everything, the Luis Robert, Kyle Tucker in the first round could be expensive, but it's easier to build squads when you have easier when you have more choices later on and getting some of the scarce categories very early on help with that even if you're overpaying a little bit so that that's my piece of advice on the outfield build but otherwise i agree with everything there and yeah know your guys at the end like jeff said uh as well uh quick injury update ruvain Yep, I got two players, actually. Um, Luis Severino says he's already throwing bullpen sessions, and he's expected to be ready as a starting pitcher whenever spring training starts. So if you're looking for a late uh, pitcher, we may get some good value out of Luis Severino. And Spencer Torkelson, he played in the Arizona Fall League, which we, which both um, Ariel and Jeff, you were there. We, we watched Spencer Torkelson play actually before he got yep. injured. He sprained his ankle, and he says he's nearly recovered, which means that the sprain was a probably a, bitty, a pretty bad sprain. But if he's nearly recovered, that means he should be good to go when the season starts, when it starts. Well, there you go. Well, this is a great episode, Jeff. I think we touched on a lot of great topics, did a lot of outfielders. And there are nice pockets of value in the outfield, and you just have to look for them, right? Indeed. Uh, and uh, it's always fun. It's always fun to dig in the uh, like dig in the corners a little bit there. I think that's I, I, I learned of some players. I'm going to bump up. So we learned something today. Yeah. Well, you can follow Jeff Erickson at Jeff underscore Erickson on Twitter. He uh, is on Sirius XM pretty much daily and he was over at Rotowire on the Rotowire baseball podcast, uh, which is a five day podcast a week. I think you do three out of the five shows, I think. Yep, that um, is correct. Usually yeah. Sunday night, then Tuesday early evening. Now it's been lately. And then Thursday at whenever I can book my guest. I highly recommend it. I listen to, I would say, almost every single episode uh, as it comes out. Really great show. Uh, anything else to, to promote uh, on your end? Uh, just Rotowire is a free 10-day trial. Always rotowire.com slash free. Doesn't require a credit card. If you don't like it, it just goes away. You know, none of that auto charging stuff. It just, it's just one of those things that you can just check out when you get a chance. And I will say that the Rotowire starting pitcher guide during the season is a must look at. Like when you're planning who you're picking up, who's going to start when, they do such a great job, the best of anyone. So I'll give my props to Rotowire there. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah. Ruben, how about you? You can follow me on Twitter at MLB Injury Guru, where I tweet out injury updates. Slow right now, but it's going to be steady when the season starts to begin. I also have an in-season article on Rotoboiler discussing all these injuries once uh, on a weekly. On a, it usually comes out on a Saturday, so you're able to prep for your fab. All right, and I'm Ariel Cohen. You can follow me on Twitter at ATCNY. I'm over at Fangraphs, over at Rotoboiler. ATC projections up on a bunch of sites, so check them out. And, of course, you can listen to me on the Beat the Shift podcast every single week. All right, from all of us here at Beat the Shift, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangress. Follow us on Twitter at beat underscore shift underscore pod.